parents through the eyes of an insider. I will be reading off of his book uh, on the back cover as my intro. Donald Tenuakata is a emeritus professor of history at California State University, Dominguez Hills, a recipient of the California State University Trustees System-Wide Outstanding Professor Award. He served as planning commissioner and city councilman in Gardena, California, on the governing boards of the California Historical Society and the Historical Society of Southern California, and as an elected officer of the American Historical Association. He was born in 1939 in East Los Angeles and incarcerated at the age of three in the United States War Relocation Authority concentration camp at Gila River, Arizona during World War II. And by the way, He's turned into quite the artist. Here is, I don't know if you can see it, but this is one of his many watercoloring renditions on a note card. You know, like I said, I read his introduction off of the back cover of his book. As you can see, uh, Dr. Hata, well accomplished, well published, and highly awarded. But what is missing from the back cover is the fact that he was nominated Outstanding Professor by his students, not by faculty, but by his students. And as a former student of Dr. Hartus, I can attest to the fact that this award was well deserved. What made him outstanding was that he truly cared about his students getting an honest and truthful education, as well as succeeding in life. Yes, he was hard driving, brutally honest, and he bled red on all my papers. But it was because of him, he pushed his students to their potential and beyond. And for that, in addition to introducing you, I'd like to take this opportunity to just say thank you. So with that, you're on. Thank you, Eileen. You're very generous. Can you hear me back there? Actually, it's because of Eileen's uh, innate intelligence and self discipline that she made it in spite of whatever I did. Now, the title today is Exploring the Japanese American World War II Experience Through the Eyes of an Insider. I'm trying something today. Probably shows you why I'm a increasingly dumb old man because you ought to do what's comfortable and you know it's safe. But this is, I'm going to base this talk on memories I had, nightmares I had as a child in my childhood years and junior high school. Unnerving, unsettling of memories. When I asked my parents about them, they either stonewalled me and, or did not provide satisfying answers. And as the years went by and I became a teacher myself, I learned that my experience was not unusual at all. In fact, there was this generational silence on which parents, especially in the 1960s, as students joined the revolution, civil rights, anti-war, uh, Japanese American students looked at their comrades in their classroom, they looked at women, they looked at African Americans, and and realized that these people were more outspoken. Whereas in their own families, they were very apolitical. They avoided controversy like politics. And it was a great experience for Japanese and other Asian Americans because it gave them some insights as to what a real American is all about. This is a participatory democracy. So if you don't participate, you're not supporting the system. When you participate, you can dissent as well. That's part of our system. And so many Japanese American students went home and asked their parents, why didn't you talk about this, this, this wartime experience, this awful experience you guys went through, but you pay nothing. Many students, in fact, in my classes came to me during my office hours and confidentially said, you know, I think my parents really did something bad because they don't want to talk about it. So they're hiding something. Well, so this has enormous implications. 
That generational silence continues today. There are many, many uh, Japanese Americans. People who retired from their jobs, their grandparents, and they still don't know what happened to their parents during World War II. Well, I mean, I better stick to my notes after this. Uh, so you're going to get a perspective that I don't normally give, and that's through my own experiences as a child. So beware. This often will fit, uh, there'll be stuff on a child's perspective. I used to warn my students, if I, get, if I, if I, if I don't catch myself and I, I start blabbing, just keep in mind that I was a kid when I'm describing these things about World War II. Kid, three years old. That means that all the soldiers were 20 feet tall. So beware, perspective is very important. Also, I, I grew up thinking that all white guys in uniform had really bushy nostril hair because I was always looking up at them, helping my perspective on the world. Well, throughout this talk, I'm going to uh, help elevate the vocabulary. There's a term Chicano, Chicana. These are hard fought terms that are now part of our American vocabulary. And they mean what? Not a Mexican, but American or Mexican ancestry. But let's do the same for Japanese Americans. There's a term you're all familiar with from the stock exchange, the word Nikkei. It literally means Japanese American. So instead of the Japanese Americans or Americans of Japanese ancestry, all that cumbersome stuff, just say Nikkei. All right? And you'll be educating fellow Americans. And they can become a part of an insider group that has a lot higher level of vocabulary. So I'll be using Nikkei throughout this session. For those of you who may not be familiar with the mass removal and incarceration of Nikkei in World War II, it consists of two phases. It's quite simple. Two phases. Okay, so it's not a complicated story. But before I launch into that, a couple more words. I use the terms gulag, which is usually uh, related to Soviet uh, Union concentration camps for political prisoners, because that's what happened to us. We were in a gulag. We were political prisoners in concentration camps, right? So you'll hear me use the term gulag instead of mass removal or the government's euphemisms like evacuation. We evacuate people who are in need of help. And that's what the government has done in their language. They try to whitewash this whole episode by making us think it was such a benign and positive operation for our own good. And he used terms like evacuation and relocation, all benign positive terms. These are lies. Government propaganda designed to distort the truth, to hide the truth. So now let's, let me give you the very simple formula for how to divide the whole saga of the gulag and the diaspora of the mass removal into two distinct phases. Phase one was very brief. Phase one was six months, starting with the beginning of the war, and six months that ran to June of 1942. During that period, all persons of Japanese ancestry on the west coast of the United States were rounded up and incarcerated in what they call assembly centers, local facilities that were capable of housing 10,000 people. These turned out to be uh, fairgrounds like Pomona for us in LA or Santa Anita racetrack. And the same kinds of facilities up and down the Pacific coast, fairgrounds, racetracks. Those punctual people who got there first got the worst because the racetracks, they were living in horse stalls. And later on, they built barracks in the parking lots for you know, those who were coming in later. Six months. During this six month period, there are people like my family, not a whole lot of them, but my family was always looking for ways to get around uh, and find new folks. And so my parents were reading the newspaper and they said, oh, this security zone along the Pacific coast is constantly changing. You know, if we move far enough inland, maybe we don't have to go to the assembly centers. So we were called voluntary evacuees. 
Well, every day, every week, the line has changed because the government wanted more territory under their control. Curfew areas, charity areas. Uh, but my folks said, well, we got relative in the Central Valley in Fresno. That ought to be far enough inland to say. So we did not experience phase one, the six months of the assembly centers. Instead, well, I'll, I'll tell you in just a moment, as I begin to uh, systematically go into the memories. During this period of six months, a new federal agency was created, the WRA, the War Relocation Authority. New federal agency, meaning that the president who had promised the end of the depression, full employment, was able to hire new people for this new federal agency, WRA. And there you had a mission, very simple. You are to go out and identify areas where we can build 10 major prisons to house 120,000 people. So they divided it up and they figured, well, 10 major prisons would, would, would handle uh, 120,000 people. So each camp would have 10,000 people, 10,000 prisoners. So they went out and there was a lot of opposition. A lot of people in all the Western states who weren't too happy about accepting people with Japanese faces you know, who were related to the people with Bomb Pearl Harper. But there's an interesting element in how history operates. In just about every human endeavor, a great motivator is greed and money. And therefore, governors of states that were normally tied to the Confederacy, like Arkansas. They got two camps in Arkansas. As soon as the war was over, they kicked everybody out because they didn't want any Japs around in Arkansas. But during the war, federal money built a lot of camps and that meant a lot of jobs. So the local economy profited. Is my message clear? This whole story is in part a story of greed and money and how we were used. People got rich over people like us. With the exception of two prisons in California, uh, Manzanar was one up in the Owens Valley. The other was two to make way up uh, just south of the Oregon border, remote sites. With the exception of those two camps, Tule Lake and Manzanar, all the other camps were beyond California, beyond the coast. There was uh, Minidoka in Idaho, Park Mountain in Wyoming, Topaz in central Utah. There was a camp in southeastern Colorado uh, that went by either the name Amachi or Granada. Colorado is usually thought of in terms of John Denver songs, right? Rocky Mountain High. Well, Granada was in the southeastern section of Colorado. It doesn't have any Rocky Mountain High. It, it, the, the part of Colorado that starts the Great Plains was flat. And oh God, it's hot and it's isolated. I've been there. At sundown, there are, there are beetles that come out you know, the size of sparrows. There were other separate prisons as well as a WRA system. The Department of Justice had their own camps. Okay? DOJ, Department of Justice camps, with their own agendas. The Immigration and Naturalization Service also had their camps with their agendas. And the US Army had its own camps. And then there were all these little civilian detention centers where people love to collect federal money. You see, if you were branded an outcast in one of the 10 WRA camps, and you were, they were gonna make an example of you, you'd be banished from the camp and you disappear. And you might be in a local jail where the room that the cell you in was being paid for by the federal government. So the local police profited too. Everybody was caught up in this rigged system. All right? Don't let anybody say that they were feared, patriots. People make money. You might hear a theme developing here. I am angry at the taxpayers. 
as an American citizen, with this story who had been ignored and suppressed and minimized for so long, the story of greed, illegal activity, corruption, violation of our rights. By all means, we ought to be pushing this case before an international war crimes tribunal. Nobody's done that. We've been too damn polite. I recall as a three-year-old kid sitting between my mother and father in a car. It was a cold, gray, gloomy morning just after sunrise. We were parked down the street from our house. We sat silently, slouched down low on our seats. We were looking out the window. We were looking at men and women looting the house we had just vacated. The cop was there on the curb, but he looked the other way. My parents were very quiet. It took a while until I realized I looked left, my dad, right to my mom. They were both weeping. I never forget the expressions on their faces. Sadness, despair, impotence, resignation. The Japanese phrase, shikataganai, can't be helped. It's like silabi. I never seen my parents cry before, and I rarely saw them cry again. No small child should ever have to see his or her parent cry out of impotence, out of the realization that they had they were unable to care for those for whom they were responsible. I remember that's what this country did to us and our spirit. No neighbors have responded to a big handwritten sign that said. Household sale emergency. It was handwritten, it was in the front window of our house, but nobody responded until we vacated and then they stormed in. Now, my parents were a young couple. They both came from farm families. My mom grew up picking string beans in what would become Doheny Drive in Beverly Hills. My dad's family lived in South. The Western area, uh, suburbs now called Bellflower and Downey. Bad soil. They always used to talk about bad soil. They grew cauliflower, cauliflower, cabbage. They were tired of back breaking, stoop labor, farm life. So my mom and dad, as a young couple, wanted to move into the big city. And somehow they scraped up the money to get a little mom and uh, retail grocery store uh, near where the, the great LA produce, wholesale produce market is located, corner of 7th and Central. It's still there, big produce market. They had great plans for the future. Remember, my mom would every week take out a couple of wooden cabinets with her chest of silver that she got as a young bride. She wanted to polish it. Silver is terrible. It could be a cost coming out. Polish the damn stuff. Stainless steel is much more functional. But my mom loved those two chests full of silver. But when the day came to leave, she couldn't take them because we were only allowed to take what we could carry. And then she had this dumb little kid named Donnie who insisted that his teddy bear had to go. My mom never stopped reminding me of that for the rest of her life. You haven't demanded and cried and whined and screamed about needing your teddy bear. I could have saved at least one of my chests of silver. But no, the space in the suitcase for the silverware was taken up by Donnie's teddy bear. Well, they had big plans. But on December 7th, 1941, other forces intervened over which we had no control, those forces changed our lives forever. And those forces weren't just the Imperial Japanese enemy who bombed our base at Pearl Harbor. It was our own government officials who had sworn to protect and serve, who did it to us too. We were scapegoats. Here are some scapegoats. 
to divert public attention from their incompetence. The Japanese attacks should never have succeeded, but our people were lazy, arrogant. The Japanese were even surprised themselves how relatively easy it was to attack Pearl Harbor. President Franklin Roosevelt, who had great speech writers, proclaimed it as a day that would live in infamy when he declared war on the Empire of Japan. Two months later, after being pressured by West Coast interests, people who wanted the property that we had developed, farmlands, truck farms, urban businesses, he succumbed to that kind of pressure, as well as the pressure of having to somehow save face after this humiliating Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. He signed Executive Order 9066, EO 9066, on February 19, 1942, two months after Pearl Harbor. EO 9066 quickly led to the mass removal of all persons of Japanese ancestry from the Pacific Coast. Let me stop here. All of you have gotten a, a copy of the poster. The, uh, this is a reduction of a poster that's through the 18 by 24 inches. This is tacked on to telephone poles, public places, and it says instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry living in the following area. This is the damning evidence. This is how arrogant they were in their explicit racism that they could put something like this out. What should they have said? They should have said, attention, all persons of Japanese citizenship. That would have meant anybody who was a Japanese citizen was citizen of an enemy nation with whom we were at war, right? No, they say anybody of Japanese ancestry. It means that citizenship meant nothing. This is how arrogant and explicit a racist nation we were until the civil rights movement of the 60s. A real American revolution would not take place until the 60s. They don't teach US history that way, but at least we did. Mass removal led to mass imprisonment, over 120,000 men, women, kids, elderly. The majority were U.S. citizens by birthright, like me. I was three years old, Donny Hatta, but I had been born in the United States and I was a citizen by birthright. And when I say most of us were citizens, what about the others who weren't most of us? These were our immigrant grandparents who had come from Japan. They came from Japan even though they knew that in this country, the US government forbade any Asian from even taking a naturalization test to become a US citizen. It started with the Chinese before us, and then it became a pattern. We inherited it, and then other Asians as well. The strong anti Asian paranoia, racism in this country goes way back. And here now, the start of World War II, we had amongst us. Most of us were U.S. citizens by birthright, but we had maybe one fifth of the population of the inmate were our immigrant grandparents. They were in a very precarious position, and it would become more precarious as the war went on. I don't have time to say about that at the moment. Well, I was a three-year-old child. And although I was a U.S. citizen by birthright, didn't mean anything in that, in that environment. I was a three-year-old child with a face and a name that sealed my face. Years later, then I began to be conscious of these memories and dreams that I had suppressed. But let me go on to another note. I remember as a little kid, after leaving our house, being led out to pee on the side of a road, busy highway, on our way to somewhere. Column of cars is parked along the highway. Other kids were being led out to pee as well. The cars had rolled up mattresses tied to the fenders. We looked like a bunch of refugees from Arkansas and Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl days. Big passing semi trucks. You know how busy 99 is, Highway 99, all those trucks bringing stuff down at night and day. 
big passing semi trucks honked. Not friendly honks, but these are honks and the drivers would roll down their windows and they stick their hands out and give us a finger. My family, as I said, never went to the assembly center phase. We, we were trying to escape. We were headed to the port, to the Central Valley, to freedom, safety, with these relatives who were beyond the security zone. Well, a problem was that when we got there with this relative who had a farm near Fresno, other smarter people had started out earlier and they were there already, so there was no space for us. So I remember weeks of living in the only space available in a chicken coop in the back of the, 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 the barn. I remember weeks sleeping in a stinky chicken coop until one day we saw this dust cloud coming down from the main highway along the road to our small farm. Several trucks with local cops and a few FBI agents. They put us on the trucks. I don't remember much more except the trucks got us to somewhere where there was a railroad station. We were put on the railroad cars and we continued on our journey to God knows where. I don't think my parents, well, I certainly didn't. We were just on that train. Another memory of that train. Every time we approached the town, the porters came up and down the aisle saying, shut the windows and lock them tight. We don't want any breezes coming in. And then they said, pull down the shades tight. And we couldn't see outside as we rumbled through these towns. And the outsiders couldn't see in. Years later, when I saw documentary films about the Nazis hoarding Jews for the death camps, it was a stark deja vu moment. It was unbearably hot with the windows shut. Shade pulled down. People vomited. Toilets backed up. Train cars reeked of feces and urine and vomit. And it was hot and steamy, chewing. I don't only have a visual but I had a total sensual reminder of my birthright of Barbara growing up in America. After weeks, though, it seemed to be weeks. I can't really recall now, could have been days. We finally arrived at a place called Gila, Arizona, in the far southeastern corner of Arizona, close to the Mexican border. I remember getting off the train. I saw dozens of closely packed rows of unpainted barracks. And so it got closer, it was clear there was no paint on those barracks, it was just park paper. Private contractors had hired local workers, jobs were created, as Franklin D. Roosevelt had promised. This was all going to help end the Great Depression. Local economies, boom, money was made. But in the process, they used shoddy construction materials that saved money, went for more profits. Poor designs. There were gaps and walls and roofs and floors that led in the sand, especially when the sandstorms came, often. We had one pot belly stove from the barrack, but all that heat, or that little heat, was let go as the gaps took the heat outside during the winter. It was cold. The floors had gaps let in the sand again. You'd wake up in the morning. And you'd have to be really careful before you popped open your eyes because there would be a, a layer of sand on your eyelids. And if you popped open your eyes, that sand would go on your eyes and you'd never get it out all day. The gaps in the floorboards, the walls, and the roof also made privacy impossible. People who have gave out loud farts could be heard across the way into the next barrack. If you had family arguments, those were all revealed. If you tried to have sex, well, babies were born, but it was a harrowing experience. And for that alone, forcing people to have sex like animals in bins, that alone 
qualifies us for nomination to an international military tribunal for crimes against humanity. Yes. We Tell me when it's fixed. I can't remember stuff like that. Yeah. How long has this been going on? Can you say something so we can check if, if it's better? Can you talk and say something? Testing, testing. My name is Donald Trump. Can you hear me? My name is Donald Trump. I'm an asshole. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I'm not going to repeat everything. We'll just go on. All right. Another memory. I remember how my parents were cheering one day. This is unusual because for six months, he was very grim. Japan was winning the war. We were always losing. Uh, and here they were cheering because the news had come out that the U.S. Navy had won a great victory at the Battle of Midway Island, June 4 through June 6, two critical days in 1942, six months to the day almost after Pearl Harbor. Well, indeed, Imperial Japan had six months of glory after Pearl Harbor. They, they not only conquered the U.S. Philippines, they, they forced the British into a humiliating surrender at Singapore and Malaya. They grabbed the Dutch East Indies with their oil fields. They took all the rice growing areas in French Indochina. Japan was on a roll. And then six months into the war, the Battle of Midway Island. It surprised everybody. It surprised the Japanese. It surprised us Americans because we went into the Battle of Midway with this naval battle group that was just scraped together with whatever was left over after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So we were outgunned and out, outnumbered. But through a combination of Japanese arrogance and dumb luck and a lot of crazy courage, we won. The core of the Japanese offensive capability were the aircraft carriers, right? The aircraft carriers that had launched that devastating revolutionary tactic, attack from the air, from the sea. And now they were gone. Japan would go on after that to build more aircraft carriers and train more pilots, but they never recovered from the loss of that core cadre. It was all lost at Midway Island. So why were my parents cheering? It puzzled me because everybody had been so sad for six months and now they're cheering. And the newspaper had a photo, a propaganda photo of a Japanese soldier in buck teeth, Coke bottle glasses, uh, terrible looking character, vicious. And my parents said, well, look, you should be happy, Donnie, because you're an American. We're Americans. The Japanese are our enemies, and we just defeated our enemy. You should be cheering, too. And so I asked, well, why? Why are we locked up here, then? Why, are you keep, why do you keep telling me don't walk too close to the barbed wire, or you're going to get shot? I said, aren't I an American then? Why don't they let me up to the top of the guard tower 
and move around one of those machine guns? My parents could not give me a, a good answer. Most important to this story is that after the Battle of Midway, six months into the war, the mass evacuation was where? Still local. The assembly centers were Santa Anita Racetrack, Amona Fairgrounds. Every intelligence agency in the US knew and agreed that there was no longer after the Battle of Midway, any credible threat of a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, let alone the Pacific coast of the continental United States. We should have been let go at that space. Mona, fairgrounds, the racetrack at Santa Anita. That was close to home. We could have stopped then, six months into the war. But at high levels, there were decisions made that, well, we better defeat Hitler first because we want to liberate the poor oppressed Europeans. And so the war strategy was what? A token force of US Marine units would hold the line in the Pacific while we turned all of our efforts to Europe, defeated Germany, and then turned the assault onto Japan. And that's why you have all these heroic stories about gallantry in the Pacific, you know, outnumbered, outgunned Marine units, Wake Island and other places fighting against the savage out in the numerous Japanese enemy. Followed money. Contracts had been signed. The War Relocation Authority, remember, not only had the responsibility of going out and finding sites to build 10 major prisons, but they found them because the governors wanted federal money. And the contracts had been signed with private contractors. And that's why nothing happened to us to let us free after the Battle of Midway in June 4, 6, 1942. The whole nightmare could have stopped for us then. But no, 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 no. White people needed jobs. Footnote here. There were no black people hired by the WRA either. All right? Don't ever forget that. This was still that explicit societal-wide racist country called the United States of America. The revolution would not begin until the 60s. The nightmare would continue. I remember the soldiers. There weren't many soldiers at Gila or most of the 10 camps. You see, all they were needed for really was to man the front gates and the guard towers along the, the barbed wire perimeter. So how did they control 10,000 people in each camp? They were vastly outnumbered. Well, they controlled prisons as they still do today. How do we control masses of prisoners today? Well, some very basic techniques. You intimidate. So these few soldiers did intimidate. They, they had long rifles with long bayonets, steel helmets, combat uniforms and gear. And at the tops of those guard towers, they had these big searchlights and those machine guns. And they were turned inward on us, not outward. Remember the searchlights at night. They would track you as you tried to make your way from your barrack to the communal latrine or the communal shower or the mess hall. And then once you emerged, they would track you back to your barrack. I will never forget that. To this day, when I go out in the desert and see, see the, the galaxies, it reminds me of uh, those days in camp. Somebody was always watching you. Particularly eerie memory is watching people come back from the communal showers at night because steam would be pouring off their bodies and the searchlights would pick them up. So between the steam pouring off their bodies and the searchlights reflecting on them, you know, it was like watching a horror movie, the, walk, the night of the walking dead. These were nightmares. I could not explain them. 
and recall that every day at sunset, these macho young soldiers would link their arms across the streets. One would be on the right hand barrack and the other one the left hand barrack and they'd come down the street to clear everybody at sundown. And then at the intersection, they'd do a column left or a column right and they'd stomp on some poor little kid like me who didn't get out of the way in time. And they loved it. These were bullies. Their job was to intimidate and they did. I remember hearing truck engines revving up in the dead of night. And as I peeked out the window, I remember seeing red cigarette butts glowing in the dark. Doors were slammed. You could hear things being moved around like people. Sometimes the night riders were soldiers. Most of the time they were civilian war relocation authority security staff. Next morning, my mom and other women would draw straws or sticks. You see, somebody had to go and console the family. The family whose father or brother or son had been taken away at night, put on the truck, taken to somewhere that nobody knew. We did know one thing. Somebody had informed the authorities that somebody was up to no good. So we get back to how these prisons were controlled. Intimidation, the threat of reprisals. And what do they do in all the prisons to make sure they know what's going on? They develop a system of collaborators and informers to let the administration know what might be coming down the line and how they can take steps to avoid it. So who were these? informers and collaborators in the camps. Many of the collaborators and informants were members of a self-styled super patriotic organization called the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League. The JACL actively throughout the war obsequiously collaborated to score brownie points with the camp administrators. They spied and they reported on their neighbors. And that self-serving duplicity made life even more hopeless for those who had to live every day, knowing you could trust nobody. Two terms were used to describe these collaborators and informers, Inu and Nezumi. In Japanese, Inu means dog. In Japanese, Nezumi means rat. These self-styled patriots then remind us that there are many definitions of patriotism. One of them is that patriotism is a last refuge of scoundrels. People who wrap themselves in the flag and pretend they are superior or more, and more patriotic than anybody else like these make America great people running around. War relocation authority officials systematically and deliberately destroyed all other community organizations that had been the infrastructure of Japanese America before the war. You see the WRA dealt only with the JACL. So the authority said we will deal with nobody else as a spokesperson for uh, you uh, residents of the camps, except the JACL. Nobody ever voted to give JACL that exclusive role. It came from the government and these self-serving wannabes who sucked up to the government. I remember organized sports so were encouraged to keep the prisoners busy. Keep them busy and they won't watch. The organized sports, there were multiple baseball games going on every day. The games meant that you not only got players, but more important, you got spectators. You filled up the stands and it became a de facto loyalty test because when the games were going on, guess what? The Nezumi 
and the Inu, the informers and collaborators were roaming the barracks areas, taking notes on who was still in the barrack, who had not gone to the baseball game. What were they doing? Well, hell, a lot of people were trying to use that semi-private time to have sex. To this day, I see baseball games as a loyalty test. The old American game of baseball. The hell with baseball. It's a loyalty test. I recall that as a kid, I asked my parents and my friend's parents, why is it that they call it the World Series? You know, the penultimate contest between the leading baseball teams. And they couldn't answer. I said, well, all the teams are American teams. Why call it a World Series? They couldn't answer. Finally, one day, my mother, in exasperation, took me aside and she said, Donald, you're going to get us all into trouble. She said, the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. So that's why we can call ourselves anything we want, including the World Series. I think that was one of the earliest uh, incidents of me thinking, I had better investigate the need for critical thinking here. It could have been one of those important moments when I developed a certain healthy sense of skepticism about American superiority and American exceptionalism. We make it up. I am the greatest. I remember lots of kids and teenagers having fun in the camps, including me. Yeah, you know, we didn't know about politics. Here we were, just all these people crammed in, bored, frustrated, depressed. But those were the adults. Hey, we kids loved it. And as we grew up, many Japanese Americans have told their friends, it was a wonderful experience. I had a great time. My father couldn't punish me. He was still standing the same damn chow line as I was. My parents had no authority. So a lot of people who were teenagers during those years have helped to perpetuate this lie, this distortion, that it was a wonderful period in their lives. And they've got to stop it. They've got to start being responsible citizens and telling history, not these self-serving myths about the great time they had. But in the meantime, let me share some of my memories of having a great time as a kid. We were roaming all over, always looking for mischief, and we saw all sorts of interesting stuff, stuff that we couldn't even explain at that time. For example, in some barracks, they were producing booze, all kinds of beer. We call them today boutique craft beers. But in those barracks, they were producing beer out of all sorts of raw materials and also hard booze, you know, stuff like vodka and gin. You can make that out of anything, sweet potatoes, turnips. So there were these, these, these barracks that were used for those kinds of activities. Can you imagine who the most important man was in the administration? It was a person who allocated the space use. Because somebody was letting these people do these things in these barracks, illegal activities, and getting paid off for it. So it's not just a corrupt government official we're talking about, but we're talking about what happens when we're put in the camps. What do we do? We survive by any means necessary. It means we do things to each other and for each other. We were the gamblers. We were the pimps. We were the whores. And don't ever forget that. It's not a case of villainy in the form of the oppressors putting these poor victims in the camps. It's what happened in the camps. After what we put in the camps, what we did to each other. And that full story has got to be told to understand the horror of what this experience meant and why it will never go away. It will go on for generation after generation in memory. Well, not only did we see the booze and the alcohol, gambling, oh, gambling. I've never seen so many different kinds of card games, but I remember it was really colorful. 
you know, all these jacks and things. And every table had something different, like a little Las Vegas. And people were betting. They were betting on future stuff, like giving away their house that they might return to after the war. These stories have not been told. These were not fun and games for chapsticks. They were stakes that were high. People sold their daughters. And then there were other things that we didn't quite understand as we roamed the, the barracks. At night, I mean, you could hear everything because of the crummy construction. Not only loud farts and family arguments, but muffled screams of women and the grunts of men trying to have sex. And babies were born. Some of those poor people were making love. Others were simply fucking. But this was an environment for animals, not human beings. And again, remember these kinds of examples. And let's push for an international war crimes tribunal. Stop hearing the lies of those who say we had a good time. Well, people coped with all this misery and insanity by tuning it all out. Don't our minds have a wonderful capacity to rationalize the way things? Well, you know, you saw stuff going on, you heard stuff, and you just, you created your own privacy. Well, years later, when I was taking my required undergraduate course in Psych 101, when it dawned on me that some of those memories might be of people twisting reality to a point where it was actually a prima facie case of what? Mental illness. Mental illness is then a legacy of that experience for Japanese America. One of my grandfathers was a quiet and kindly old man. He was, he'd go out in the desert and he'd come back with, with wood and he'd carve insects and butterflies and paint them with, with lacquer that he, he bought from the Sears Roebuck catalog. He, he shot his whole, whole monthly allowance doing that. For me though, he, he made a little cannon artillery piece. Oh, I had great fun with that. I'd, I'd race around the barracks and I'd push and pull this little cannon and go bang, 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 bang. Until one day my parents saw what I was doing and they were horrified. They took it away and my father dismantled it. He said, you're going to get us turned in by one of the local Inu or the Nezumi and we're going to be sent off to God knows where. So my grandfather and I were not allowed to fraternize too often. He was constantly berated and belittled and publicly humiliated by his wife, my grandmother. Theirs was a arranged marriage. They had exchanged photographs. She was in Japan, he was here. When she arrived, her photograph didn't look like what he thought she would look like. And he wasn't exactly her picture of Mr. Macho either. Oh, it was not a love match by any means. Very strained. Well, she drove her husband to drink. He became an alcoholic. His diabetes got worse, very bad. By the war's end, he had multiple amputations. My last memory of my kind old grandfather was Oji-san lying in a narrow bed in a hospital. He looked like a cocoon. All that was left of him was a torso and a head, no arms, no legs. And he died. I used to call my grandmother the bitch witch Obake. Obake is a Japanese term for demon woman. Due to sustained stress and depression, it is estimated that only 40% of all the males who were in the camps reached the age of 60. Men especially were vulnerable to feelings of impotence because 
They were used to being what? Heads of household. But here they're reduced to just another body in the line. And it was done on purpose. Ironically, the destruction of these traditional male chauvinist roles was welcomed by young women because young women in the camp saw this as an opportunity for what? Emancipation. They were hired by the camp administration to work as clerk typists. And by the middle of the war, as people were being released to go out and find jobs in the mid Midwest or go to school, she got, they got clearance and they began to move out of the camps. But it, it certainly was an unintended but important change in the status of Nikkei women. This was economic liberation for them. Not entirely. Mentality would have to change much more. Asian American women, Japanese American women would not truly become assertive until the 60s in the civil rights movement as they saw other ethnic and racial groups doing this, other women taking the lead. And from the 60s, we saw an emergence of an aggressive outspoken cadre of Japanese and other Asian American women, but it all began for the Japanese in the camps. On the other hand now, there were other women, lots of women called wives. The wives paid a terrible price trying to keep their families together. My own mother died at age 37 of abdominal bleeding. Abdominal bleeding at that time was usually a euphemism for perforated ulcers. Caused by sustained stress, emotional and physical exhaustion. My mom died on the first day of my senior year in high school. So here I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. Like going to that day she died on my first day of the senior year in high school. My dad was in no shape psychologically to go to pick up her belongings. So I went to the hospital to pick up her personal goods. And as I walked down the hall to her room, I overheard a conversation that I was not supposed to hear. As I stood in the hallway outside a room, someone inside was asking, why is it that we're seeing so many deaths from abdominal bleeding among middle-class Japanese women? Well, this was a teaching hospital. And so the people inside that room were medical students on their rounds, accompanied by a clinical professor of medicine. I've never forgotten his reply to that student question. Why are we seeing so many of these Japanese women, relatively young, middle class, dying of abdominal bleeding? He was an older man, and obviously an educated and thoughtful man. And he said something to this effect. He said, during the war, we did to the Japanese American family what we did to Negroes in this country over 200 years of slavery. We destroyed their families, or tried to. And only the women kept those families alive. And then he said, and for many like this Mrs. Hata, the burden was too much. I blame my father for my mother's death. I left home. I lived on the streets. I worked my way through college. I changed my undergraduate major no less than nine times, and I never looked back. Always I remember the long lines and lack of privacy, the explicit unfairness. Every day people lined up, as I said, to eat, to pee, to poop, to shower. There was no privacy in the toilets especially in the women's toilets, no partitions. Women and girls were especially mortified. It took demand after demand after demand 
for the authorities to finally erect partial partitions in the women's toilets. It was all part of a plan. Break their spirit. WRA propaganda photos showed bathtubs being delivered to the camps. And so the newspaper could say, look how well they're being treated. Better than us in civilian life. Bathtubs. The propaganda photos and the blurbs left out the fact that tubs were for the white civilian WRA staff who lived in accommodations far superior to the prisoners. We had communal showers and hot water only during certain hours. Ordinary prisoners earned from 12 to $16 a month. If you had special skills like being a medical doctor or dentist, they got up to $18 a month. And out of that, you had to buy stuff like Kotex for your wives and sisters and daughters. Not much was left after that. Family infrastructure by government design disintegrated in the chow line environment. Juvenile delinquency, adultery, alcoholism, spousal abuse, child abuse, unmarried pregnancies, suicides, they all became the norm. And again, if you were able to blot all that out to survive, that's not normal behavior. It means you're guilty of, not guilty, you're, you're subject to mental illness. You need treatment. I remember that medical resources were minimal. One night I almost died due to food poisoning. My eyes, my tongue, my nostrils all got swollen and I, I was unable to breathe. Somehow I survived the night. Next morning, my condition was traced to dog feces found in the bottle of soda that I had pilfered from the mess hall and greedily drank all by myself. Remember, I was not a good kid. But I almost died. Turns out that the soda was delivered from a local bottling plant. You can bet that I have never drunk that brand of soda ever since I left the Gila camp, okay? They found in that shipment that the whole shipment had bottles of soda in which there were chicken bones and animal feces, all put in there by patriots at the bottling plant. It was a more ominous uh, dimension to the lack of medical facilities. And this is also personal. If you look at me from the back as I walk, I have a certain gait. And I, when I stand in front of a, of a crowd, I assume a stand. It stands with an attitude. Almost as if I'm trying to play a gunslinger in a Western movie. It's because the polio that I had in camp was undiagnosed. They said it was childhood cold. If my symptoms had been worse, I would have been sent out of the camp and put in an iron lung because that was what was happening before the Salk vaccine eradicated polio a decade later. So the doctor said he just got a cold, stop whining. But when I got to junior high school after the war, and you have to start in physical ed courses, climbing ropes and doing tumbling, I couldn't do any of those things. And the school nurse then took me to a physical therapist and they did a, a muscle study. And they tracked it down to the fact that at the age I was in camp, my body was still young and developing. And that's when the polio distorted the, the, the growth of my, my bone structure. Uh, if you saw my x-ray, chest x-ray, I have a cervical scoliosis is, that's almost a perfect question mark. It runs sideways. And that's why the shorter arm and leg. If it ran backwards and forwards, I would be a pronounced hunchback. And as, ever since I was in middle age, my 40s, uh, we, my wife and I discovered that I was a victim of something else that few doctors know about. You see, after polio was eradicated by the Salk vaccine, guess what the medical schools did? They stopped teaching polio. Why teach it? It's eradicated. 
And so today, most doctors couldn't tell you what a polio symptom looks like. And so they missed the fact that there's something called post-polio syndrome. The symptoms are twofold. Some of them are like Parkinson's disease, neurological. The other, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I have elements of both. It's an uncurable situation. One of these days, if I don't die sooner, I'll be in a wheelchair. Well, I don't remember much about food. Remember now, I was a young kid roaming around. Lots of complaints about food from former adult prisoners. Lots. I, wanted, I don't even want to get started. We need days to discuss how bad the food was. But I and my, my, my buddies uh, roamed from mess hall to mess hall. And there were patterns that I recall seeing. You see, my, my family, my mom and dad and I, uncles and aunts, stopped eating together. And this happened throughout the camp. As the family structure broke down, males ate with other males their own age. Women did the same thing, and so did girls and boys. These are peer group operations now. The family broke down. I remember, I remember wondering as the eat healthy rage across the nation a decade ago, I wonder how I survived at all because I wasn't getting anything resembling a balanced nutrition in my eating habits as a kid in camp. We roamed from camp to camp where we knew the mess halls were serving the kinds of pies or pastries we like. And we're eating a diet of virtually entirely processed sugar and butter, little butter they gave us. Big Newtons were always available. Everybody who was an adult, even a kid remembers Big Newtons. You either love them or you hated them. Don't ever approach me with a gift of Fig Newtons. I hate Fig Newtons. One day we saw, we found bloody raw materials for our mischief. Behind the communal mess hall, there was a huge horde of flies. And so we went and discovered that these are trash cans. So we, we shushed away the flies and we opened the top of the cans and oh, the stench. There are maggots all over, crawling all over these red, fleshy, bloody bags. So we dumped the trash cans over, we kicked the maggots aside, and we picked up these bloody sack like things and uh, set home, knocked them over, knocked them over. And we ran around camp terrorizing anybody we came across. It was great fun until we were caught. In those days, corporal punishment was deemed appropriate to discipline children. I remember we all had to bend over and pull our pants down and somebody took out a, a belt and we got some stripes on our butts. One of those fathers was a sadist because he didn't just hit us with his belt, he hit us with a buckle end. Memorable memories. There's a serious side to this. There's a stench of corruption, the misuse of federal funds. We later learned that those sacks were the skins off of beef. These are beef tongue skins. They stripped off the skin, turned them inside out, and that's what we were wearing to terrorize the camp. And then they roasted the beef tongue, and then they sliced it, and they Flushed starchy brown gravy all over it, and it was offered up as roast beef and gravy. Now, most people didn't even know the difference because traditionally in pre war America, Japanese American family didn't have the money to buy to, to, to cook a dinner with a big piece of raw red meat on the plate. We took little bits of meat, pork, chicken, fish stir fried it, and dumped in a whole lot of greens, right? They still do that, they're even original. 
And we weren't used to eating slabs of roast beef. But we didn't know the difference. That we were being cheated again. At Manzanar camp, I learned later in other camps, same thing happened. Manzanar, I remember there was a huge demonstration when people protested the fact that only the administrators were getting their allotment of sugar. The prisoners were not. And the, the, the money in between, the difference was being pocketed and sold on the black market and all that. So again, follow the money. People made money off of us. Now, two huge controversies rocked the camps by the middle of the war. One, the notorious loyalty questionnaire. And the second was the brouhaha about the draft. The government, you see, by the middle of the war needed replacements. World War II, like its predecessor, World War I, were the first industrial wars. Total war. Right, industry produced weapons now that decimated thousands of people at a time. It wasn't cocking your musket and going kapow, and one guy goes down. Now thousands die. This was total war, mass destruction weapons. And so replacements were needed. And guess what? By the middle of the war, the US government decided that they would open the privilege of conscription to Nikkei who were rotting in these concentration camps because their loyalty could not be determined. But if you're gonna recruit these Japanese into camps, we better make sure about their loyalty. Better have a questionnaire or something just to cover our assets. And then another opportunistic, brilliant bureaucrat said, I'm going to put a loyalty questionnaire out for potential recruits. Let's require it of all the prisoners, women as well. And so the loyalty oath questionnaire that was originally designed for single male recruits was now distributed as a requirement for women as well. I think the cutoff age was about 17, so in effect, all adults. Two questions immediately became problematic. Let me read them through quickly. Question 27. Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty, wherever ordered? Preferred answer was, oh yes. But some people didn't answer it. Others said no, because they had reservations. What if you were ordered to go to the Pacific and ended up killing relatives on the other side of the battlefield? Women were now told, hey, you know what happens in modern warfare? All the armies have these official brothels. You give the GIs sex when they come off the line for rest and recreation. If you say yes to this, you might be volunteering to become an official US Army whore. Question 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the US from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization. Key word first for many people was forswear. Because if you read this carefully, it could mean that you said, yes, I agree to this. It means that you were agreeing to having at some time in the past sworn allegiance to the Japanese emperor. Like one of those, you know, why, why do you beat your wife questions? And then there was another more ominous part of the resistance to this question. What if you were not a US citizen? What if you were like the immigrant parents in the camps with us who were never allowed to become US citizens by naturalization? They were Japanese citizens, right? If they said yes, they were renouncing their citizenship, their Japanese citizenship. What would that mean? They would be stateless people with nobody to represent them. And by how this US government had treated us so far, could you trust them? No. So some people simply did not answer to either question 27 or 28. Well, guess what? They didn't know it. But those who were reviewing the results equated a no, a no answer at all as no, no, yes. I mean, we answer no, we're against it. 
if you answered it in part, some people said, well, I will go fight if you restore my citizenship rights first. No, any qualified answer was interpreted as a no answer. And so the word went out that there were these no-nos in the camps. That was a nickname for having answered no-no to questions 27 and 28. The WRA was astounded, frankly, uh, by how strong the resistance was. And so they went and converted one of the 10 concentration camps and renamed it and gave it a special new mission. Tule Lake concentration camp up near the Oregon border was now converted to something called the National Segregation Center. And to Tule Lake now, the WRA officials sent anybody in their camps who was deemed a troublemaker, meaning people who answered no, no, or didn't answer at all, or people who were organizing against the draft. Groups were organizing, starting at Heart Mountain, to resist the draft, unless citizenship, citizenship rights were restored first. So the opponents of the loyalty questionnaire, resistance to the draft, they were all lumped together as disloyals, unpatriotic, and they were all banished to Tule Lake. Tule Lake's population doubled in size. And that instantly meant what? No basic services, everything was overwhelmed. And in order to deter any trouble from these troublemakers at Tule Lake, unlike the other camps, now you had troops a full battalion of regular U.S. combat infantry was deployed to Tule Lake. In addition, flatbed trucks pulled a platoon of Sherman main battle tanks to be parked there in the camp in full view of the inmates as another deterrent. Midnight raids were conducted. Women children, grandpas, grandmas, ousted into the cold night air in December, looking for contraband. A special stockade was built. People who were dumped in the stockade had no visitation rights. They were tortured. Things got so bad at Tule Lake that even the FBI had to go in. You know how reluctant federal agencies are to rat on each other. Well, the FBI actually had to go in because of these allegations of torture. In one case, three people were beaten up so badly with a baseball bat that the evidence included the broken bat and gray, you know, gray matter from one guy's broken open skull. My family was not banished to Tule Lake. So we escaped a PR campaign that still haunts many Nikkei today, who were at Tule Lake. You see, the government and the JACL embarked on a concerted effort to make sure that anybody who was in Tule Lake was, was assumed to be a troublemaker, a bad person. Even today, when Japanese Americans meet each other, one of the first questions for conversation purposes, what camp were you in? Or what camp were your folks in? And people who are in Tule Lake will duck out because they're ashamed. They believe this mythology is terrible hate propaganda. Sorry about that. It says potential spam, bye-bye. Well, my family probably cooperated. I say probably because they never talked to me about this stuff, even when I asked. We left Tila. Never got, never had to go to Tule Lake, but we did go to Strange place. Has anybody in this room ever heard of Tuella, Utah? Tuella, Utah, T-O-O-E-L-E. -E. <laughs> we left Gila, went north on a train, and we got off. There was this scenario that looked very similar to the place we'd come from. There were rows and rows of barracks. But this was these were barracks constructed to a higher level of, of comfort. My mother was able to uh, to go to the base of uh, 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 BX and buy materials. And I remember her 
cutting materials with their pinking shears and making little little uh, curtains for our windows. She had a place where she could cook. We didn't have to go to a communal latrine. This is because we were now the supervisors. We had been cleared by the government to leave the camps, but we didn't have enough clearance to go back to the Pacific coast. And my parents didn't want to go west or to the east coast to go to school. Uh, this was just a kind of a dumb luck opportunity we fell into. So for the rest of the war, we were at Tuella, Utah. Guess what its function was? Tuella, Utah was the largest ordnance depot, ammunition depot in the continental United States. And all the workers were Italian and prison, uh, German prisoners of war. So my father and other Japanese American men were the supervisors. It was a weird place. All the workers pushing stuff around with these German and Italian POWs, supervisors were peaceable people with Japanese faces. And it was a little token MP detachment and pushing the flag at the front gate. Well, that's where we were when the, the war ended. And that ends my memories of the war. So let me shut it down now. In 1945, at the end of the war, the barbed wire gates opened, heads of household were given $25 cash and a one-way ticket. Most returnees arrived back in places like LA, other cities on the West Coast with nothing, no cash, no work, no place to live, and often met with hostility. The long road back would last from 1945 and for many Japanese American families into the late 1960s. It was an unending routine of hard work, sacrifice, never taking a vacation, always saving, scrimping, deferring instant gratification for long-term security. Study hard, get a degree. They can't take that away from you, was a mantra. Nearly half a century later, much to my disbelief and many others, a movement produced, a movement called the Redress Movement produced an official apology and a cash payment from the U.S. government. But that's another story. We don't have time for that today. These are about memories during the camp from the perspective of a, a little kid. In retrospect, at age 84, my entire life has been a search for identity as an American of Japanese ancestry. I'm a fourth generation native son of California. But I still often feel like a stranger in my own land. After living for a year in Japan as a grad student and experiencing the changes wrought by the civil rights revolution of the 60s and the 70s and changing my undergrad major nine times, I finally realized that teaching at the college level could be a fulfilling and responsible way to make a difference. If we can teach American students to see diversity as an asset and not a threat, we might avoid what happened to Japanese Americans in World War II. I'm not entirely optimistic about that considering the world we live in today. Citizens must be educated and not propagandized. Every generation must be taught both our past mistakes and our triumphs in order to not repeat the past. Citizens must be ready to speak truth to power or this experiment in participatory democracy will not survive. Today, our republic is in danger, grave danger from enemies within white supremacists, people who have no knowledge of our obligations to a peaceful world. And when good men and women do nothing, we are told, evil triumphs. Let us make friends, new friends and new allies in common cause. And together, let us defend our democracy. Thank you. Okay, we'll take questions, but I have a footnote. I, I, I've been pretty harsh on the organization called the JACL, Japanese American Citizens. 
since World War II, there's an effort within that organization to become more progressive. I have many friends who are members of JSL, not of the Inu or Nezumi tribes, but friends who are progressive and have tried to make JSL into a civil rights advocacy group. And so consider that footnote, right? I, I, I am very harsh on JSL's wartime policies, for which I don't think they've ever adequately apologized or acknowledged. But they are trying, at least some of them, to be, to be part of the good guys now. So with that, any questions or comments or manifestos? Yes. Uh, okay. uh, what happened to the teddy bear? Hmm? What happened to the teddy bear? The question is what happened to the teddy bear? It disappeared, I think, after I left home. After my mom died, I had carried it around that long. But you know, it, after my mom died and I was living on the streets, uh, uh, a lot of stuff disappeared. I, I just abandoned it. Bye bye, teddy bear. Yes. Question was, were the porters on the train when they told us to shut all the windows and pull the blinds, were the porters black? Yes, in fact, that brings back another memory. One of the porters took my father aside and he said, we're hoping you're gonna win this war, meaning you Japanese. A black man said that to my father with a Japanese face. Awesome. When you had to leave your homes, and you said the homes were looted, the our, neighbors, our neighbors, our neighbors, our uh, neighbors. These were not Japanese Americans. These were our neighbors, mainly U European ethnics. I don't like the word white. European ethnics. One more question. And you said people got rich. Were they white people or the JACL? I'm talking mainly here about the majority society, not the JACL. The JACL wasn't in it for the money. The JACL collaborators were there simply for status and to be uh, you know to to to, to be uh, 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 on the winning side treated like little pets but they were you know they were associated with power it was an ego thing it wasn't so much money with the JCL but the others in our society construction contractors laborers they made money off of us one of my projects if, if i was younger i'd consider doing a genealogy of everybody who worked for the WRA and track them and their families. I am a okay, good idea. You're a genealogist. Find out who worked for a WRA. Yes. Good question. She said, I mentioned all, several times the, an international war crimes tribunal. No one's responded to my, my exhortations at various places where I've spoken. Because, and here's a good example of why, the legal team that took the Japanese American cases to the Supreme Court and had them overturned in effect, Korematsu, Hirabayashi, Endo. Uh, they were led by people like uh, Dale Minami, graduate of Gardena High School, went on and he became the leader, one of the leaders of this team of young Japanese American lawyers who took up the cause. And it was a program at the Japanese American National Museum I I asked Dale, I said, Dale, why is it that you guys went to the U.S. Supreme Court? Why is it that you guys went to the U.S. Supreme Court? But at one point, all the proceedings stopped. The government decided not to continue to, to fight. And you guys didn't either. I said, why did you stop? Why didn't you go for an international war crimes tribunal beyond the Supremes? And he, he thought, and he thought, and he was quiet. And I know I'm being recorded and I'm on Zoom and a number of people who are watching on Zoom know Dale Minami. Uh, I have several emails that I've written to Dale over the years saying, I want you to confirm that we actually had that conversation at the Japanese American National Museum, at which time you said, 
we never thought about going beyond the U.S. Supreme Court. You see, we were so tired, we were so burned out, we were so relieved we got that far that we never thought out of the box in going beyond the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, and I, I know all those people on Zoom are going to hold me to account. Um, so here's what I suggest. That a good project would be to start the process, have students do papers on how do you even start the process? What organizations exist as ad, ad, advocacy groups for such a cause? And then once you enlist their aid, what are the steps that you must take to finally get yourself before the International War Crimes Tribunal? What kind of evidence, blah, 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 blah. And this would be a wonderful change than the, bore, than the boring uh, rehash of, oh, the Constitution this and the Constitution that that I see among so many uh, graduate students. You know, or the, 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 the abuse, the, the records of, of crime and illegal activities that are still in the, you know, the, in the unpacked boxes of archival documents because every camp had to submit their records. I have a friend in the archives of one of the local uh, historic sites. I, I won't mention this place, the, the camp, but it's a local historic site. It was a former concentration camp. And uh, she sent me a copy of this report from the camp police during the war in which a complaint was lodged with the police by this family. They had, uh, two teenage children who were old enough to leave the camps. Well, if there, was a, if, if there was a vacancy, it had to be filled, even if it wasn't a member of your family. So this couple moved in. And so in this complaint, these people said, you know, we are beyond our wits end. So we're appealing to you, uh, the camp security. Can you please move these people out? They love sex. She screams, he grunts. We can't do anything. We can't eat meals in our barrack. Please move them out. There's all sorts of stuff like that will add to the nitty gritty of what really happened in the camps. And certainly get us away from these whitewashed versions of, oh, we did our duty. It wasn't so bad. Everybody was nice. The food was great. We can talk later. Let's uh, put together a, a, a plan to get these things rolling. Any other questions, comments, manifestos? What time do we have? Anybody? Yes. The question is comment on two camps in Arizona. One was Poston and one was Gila. I was at Gila. Poston, by the way, uh, is a uh, common name. Poston's official name was the Colorado River uh, or relocation site. Uh, your comment that there's allegations that the Native Americans on those the reservations at Poston and Gila uh, oppose the construction of those sites. Uh, it's a complicated story, but an interesting one. Uh, there was opposition, but by the end of the war, there was uh, the realization amongst the Native Americans, especially at Poston, that the Japanese American presence there had converted uh, useless desert land through irrigation into productive agricultural zones, which now could be exploited by the Native Americans. Uh, at one time, one of the camp administrators at Poston even had a proposal that they would never release the Japanese Americans, keep them there permanently, continuing to maintain the fertile grounds they had created for farming and use the Native American population as stoop labor. You know, all sorts of things went on like that at Poston. And by the way, Poston was unique in that it was so hot at Poston that they didn't have barbed wire. They didn't need it. Uh, my good friend, Mary Gucci, whose colored painting is on the front of my little book, uh, she remembers uh, on the day they arrived at Poston, 
the temperature was 139 degrees. So it was terrible, terrible. That do for right now. Any other questions? Well, I don't want to punish you anymore by forcing you to stay here. So uh, there are refreshments and I'll be around to take any questions if you want. Uh, Eileen, can we formally adjourn these proceedings? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Can people on Zoom ask any questions? Yes. We've asked, yes, but they haven't responded yet. Wait a minute. Here, here. Oh. you got to be right in front of it. Sorry. For the people on Zoom, we had some technical issues early on. We will send recordings out to everyone so you can get caught up on what was said the first um, probably half an hour of the <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, of the presentation. Um, give me give me till tomorrow to get it out to you, but I'll try as quickly as possible to do that. Um, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you. We will not take any questions now from the, the Zoom people. Um, looks like they don't have any. Oh, okay. Yeah. Come on, I know some of the people out there. Don't you have any gripes? Okay, be safe. <laughs>